I want to welcome you to the first of 625 at 625. We are joined today by three really great panelists. Um, I will do a very brief introduction, tell you about who they are, um, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a, a kind of intro to the topic, but I want to make sure I explain who's joining me. John Lowenstein, on my right, is a photojournalist. He's worked here in Chicago. He's done a lot of work on the South Side. He's done a lot of work in immigration. He's worked internationally in Afghanistan, in Haiti, in Uganda, lots and lots of places. Um, he particularly works in an in-depth way, mm -hmm. long documentary series. Um, we are starting what I hope grows into a collaboration about some issues of gun violence, education, and policies, um, mm -hmm. and learn more about his work and come visit his new studio yep. in South Shore. Yep. Uh, Jerome McDonald, I would bet almost everybody here gets a lot of news from Jerome. We're very pleased to have him for Worldview today. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Jerome tells us what's going on. Right? On the radio. Yes. No um, pictures. Yeah. No pictures. But that's actually not true because Jerome's website is full of pictures and all of the stories, if you go to the website, have great links and illustrations. And I heard him do a whole show the other day about a book of photography that you couldn't actually see. And it was really good, right? I heard that. <laughs> it's really yeah, good. I talked to John once. There you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. He so about, he talks people on the phone, he yeah. brings them in. So um, one of the reasons that we asked Jerome here today is because we're really curious what kind of images move him to cover a story. What, what are the images that somebody like John might take that Jerome and his team, Alexandra and Steve Bynum, would see and then decide to pursue and follow up? Um, on the policy side, Ambassador Ian C. Kelly is here. He's a diplomat, I'm going to get this right, diplomat in residence for the Midwest, based at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He has worked around the globe, um, particularly in regions like the former Yugoslavia, yeah. Russia, the Balkans. I mean, that says the same thing twice, but you know, a, a kind of range of areas. Um, and he has served as a press attaché in a number of places, um, also Rome. Um, and he's here a little bit because we were curious from the policy side, say at the State Department, what are the kinds of photographs that you wake up in the morning if your job is to talk to the press and you say, wow, I wish that was not above the fold this morning in the New York Times? Or why didn't that picture get above the fold? Or I can use this to get my colleagues to do something that really can make a difference. So that was sort of the goal. Um, so if we can turn the lights out, I thought what would be interesting is just to take a few minutes and, um, and talk about how photographs have been used. There's, there's lots and lots of ways, but how photographs have been used kind of historically um, to try to make change. And, and we can evaluate whether that works or that, that doesn't work. Um, but, uh, but just to sort of let us have a point. This is the work that our group does. This is our first project. It was called Darfur, Darfur. Um, obviously, this is in front of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And we took images that had been taken by 10 photographers, and we projected them on buildings in many, many cities to try to raise education and awareness. Um, we can circle back to Darfur, but one of the things that those of us who worked in advocacy would argue is that we have failed dramatically. The government has, cha has not changed. There is more violence in different parts of Sudan than there were before. Uh, if you work on the NGO refugee side, you would push back and say there has been funding for millions of displaced people because of the attention and awareness that was done. Um, you'll come to your own conclusions how you feel about that. Um, I'm starting with this photograph because sometimes we forget. This is by William Henry Jackson of Yellowstone, and it was taken in 1871, 72. And it was an entirely targeted trip. Roosevelt wanted to establish the national parks. Uh, this country was all about using natural resources, and so 
really cumbersome photography was done to explain to people that we had these great resources and we should protect them before we destroyed them. It was a relatively successful sort of project. We have uh, a lot of national parks. Um, obviously, if you fast forward to tar sands, we're not necessarily protecting the environment as well as we might, but, but this is kind of where the fight began. Um, again, the classic, Dorothea Lange, Florence Owens Thompson, 1936. Photography, again, in a very targeted way. Um, the, the hiring of Dorothea Lange wasn't really the point. The point was to go out and take these shots, which would generate sympathy, attention, uh, support for the New Deal, and social change. We move into Robert Kappa's work. This is D-Day, um, in some ways the man who invented war photography. Um, these are famous pictures for a couple of reasons, but one of is that his assistant may or may not have ruined them all, or the ones that we've never seen. But again, these shots were taken and used in a lot of kind of propaganda ways to, to provide support. This is a point in the war in which there was a lot of support. Um, these were very difficult and painful things that were happening, and Americans weren't used to seeing them at home. An entirely different, and in some ways more familiar, um, kind of use of photojournalism, this is Charles Moore, Birmingham. And these photographs, I'm going to go back here, these photographs, as I'm sure many of you know, had an incredible impact because Robert Kennedy and his brother were trying, or maybe not trying hard enough, or maybe trying really hard and weren't getting anywhere, um, along with the vice president, to figure out how to pass the Civil Rights Act, what to do with it, what was going to happen with voting rights, how was this going to work. And much of the country didn't realize these things were happening. There was not this widespread awareness. There was no social media. There were no phones. People didn't see this and then take a picture and send it to their cousin in New York. So if you weren't there, it didn't happen. Um, this photograph was taken in 1963. And I remember being struck. I was born in 1964 to extremely sort of, you know, liberal parents who never ate a grape, who, you know, we, we kneeled at the altar of, of the strike of Chavez. And I remember asking my father why he wasn't on a bus. And he said, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know this was happening. Mm. That these, these sorts of things. And so when these photos came out, Bobby Kennedy and others were terrified. And they thought, we have to do something. We have to do something now. Um, jumping forward, but not too much we enter into the first sort of televised war, the war that you could see on the nightly news. And I've put just a couple of shots in series chronologically. So you have Eddie Adams' shot um, of the assassination in the street of a North Vietnamese Viet Cong. You have then, back here at home, John Philo, Kent State, 1970. So that's two years later protesting. And then 1972, we're still there. And Nick Ut takes a photograph of Kim Phuc. She's nine years old, and we're dropping napalm. And the fact that these photographs continue to be iconic, and, and you know, when we have these conversation about drones and, and collateral damage and what are we doing, we have this record. Now, whether any of whether you know, these photos created this resistance and back and forth and how quick that is and what the boomerang effect is or isn't is, is hard to pinpoint in many ways, but there's no question that we left. The flip side, uh, this is Czechoslovakia, Joseph Kudelka. This photograph was taken in 1968 and at great risk he took this series of photographs and smuggled them out. They became part of the Magnum collection for whom he shoots. You could argue nothing happened. They had the revolution. The Russians came in. And it was a long time before he could go back. 
and yet the photo was equally powerful. There's a whole series of them. I think they were released without being, he wasn't named. He so was it anonymous, was, yeah, it was yes. Anonymous yes, they were, they were anonymous. But there was not a global outcry, and the world did not come in and rescue Czechoslovakia. That's just a sample of kind of how these things have been done over the years. I'm going to close this section with two. Um, one is the great manipulator. Ansel Adams um, dedicated most of the later part of his life to the Sierra Club and to saving the work, or saving the places that we saw in the first photo. Um, one of the most interesting things you can do in photography is, is look at how Adams printed his work over the years. When he started to do this for the Sierra Club, these photographs became extraordinarily manipulated and his kind of master class of, of printing and all of this theory came out of this desire and these, these rocks which are already beautiful became more and more gorgeous and more and more elegant and the funding that came out of this and the gift that he gave to the Sierra Club, you know, was very much consciously through the manipulation of this work. Um, in many ways, it's a great success story. On the other hand, this is not. Ron Haviv took this photo at the beginning, and I'm showing it here on the website of the New York Times Lens Blog on purpose, because this article by James Estrin is an interview with Ron in which he's talking about how he took that photograph of the death of this couple in Bosnia at the very beginning of the violence or when he was first there. And he was sure that if he took this photo and he sent it out into the world, that there would be no genocide, that these things that unfolded and in, I understand that you have some familiarity with this, would not happen. And instead, these photographs have been very useful at the ICC, and they are very useful in convicting the ICTY, um, International Criminal Court, and so forth at The Hague. But they were not helpful in stopping the war, at least not until many, many people lost their lives, and so forth. Um, so I think we'd stop right there for a minute, just if that's kind of a frame of some pros and some cons, and so forth. And um, for those who haven't seen John's work, I just want to show a couple of images. So, John, do you want to tell us what we're seeing here? Uh, this is a photograph taken on, of a store window, kind of a small local store uh, in the Burnside neighborhood on 83rd Street, um, just east of Commercial. And I just kind of, I, I like going back again and again to the same place and photographing and seeing kind of the changes of uh, what's going on on the south side, kind of the space between post-industrial meltdown to where Starbucks kind of comes in and these communities that really are being kind of simultaneously ignored, left behind, and also in many ways gentrified and sort of the land being colonized and taken over in a lot of ways. I, I don't know if colonized is the right word, but definitely the land is seen as valuable at this point. So, um, you know, issues of education, so closed schools, um, you know, the life of people in the community. I taught at a school called Paul Revere Elementary School for five years, uh, taking pictures there in that community. This is from your immigration? This is from immigration. I just gave a few different pictures. Uh, this is from a project I've been working on for a long time, tracing the migrant trail from Central America and Mexico, United States and back, specifically looking at the impact of public policy and political policy on undocumented migrants and people who've come up uh, to live in the United States. So this was in Chicago. It was a guy who had um, gotten cancer and they're raising money yeah. to, so you see his face is kind of on the photograph and that's him on the left and they're raising money to, for healthcare. And yeah, and so I try to look really at the impact of political social policy on individuals. So how does these kind of larger issues play out on da in daily life for people. And then I really enjoy going back and photographing kind of the same place over and over, particularly on the south side of Chicago. Because I think as you go back again and again over years, you constantly have to challenge yourself and I have to challenge myself to see the place in a new way and see the nuance to it. So I actually have an Instagram account if you want to follow that at John Lowenstein. It's kind of interesting because you'll be able to see the photographs that I do every day and kind of, you know, looking at the space, everything from, again, closed schools, 
there's something that happens in the neighborhood, it could be a crime scene, to parties, to friends' houses, to, and so it becomes kind of a different way of seeing the place. So that's kind of what I do. <laughs> yeah. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. Thanks for me. Right, exactly. Um, so I guess picking up on that, um, are the photographs that you have taken or series that you have taken that you felt really had great traction, that you saw a social issue that you wanted to talk about, that you feel went out in the world and were successful? You know, I feel that I don't know about change, whether it's actually changed um, policy, but I definitely feel that I've been pretty successful in getting the work out over a long period of time consistently into the media, into people's consciousness, and from a very kind of personal level of working directly in the community, whether it's teaching, one-on-one -on -one interactions, the actual act of photographing can be powerful, to, you know, making sure that I can get stories that I care about out, and then just serving as a witness to these things that are happening both in our community and also in the larger world. I do think I've been able to do that. Have I felt that like the photographs have had any great impact um, in terms of politi direct political policy and change? I wouldn't say that mine have, but you know, you never know what it means to, when you, like after 2007, there was a raid in Beardstown, Illinois, and I went to Beardstown the next day and pitched in Time Magazine and got a story in Time Magazine. So did that lead to anything? I don't know, but is there immigration reform today because I took a picture? No, we're still debating the same issue. These issues are very large, but at the same time, I feel that everybody, you have a choice um, whether or not you're going to do something that you care about and you want to do what you can and then you try to get it out and I think that's really what photographers can do we do our best to take to be there to photograph what's happening to show what's going on and then we try to get it out into the world and you really don't know what that impact is going to be necessarily and so I photograph to witness to show what's happening and stuff that I really care about and then I do my best in a variety of platforms at this point to get it out well, I guess the question then, Jerome, it begs, I mean, if John sends you a photograph, if I send you a photograph, you know, it says, would you, would you like to talk about this issue? You have a million things that you could talk about. Um, how do you decide? Which, which one? Is it because you already know about the topic? Is it because you get moved? Um, what do you think drives you in selecting what you cover? Well, you know, I'm on the radio, so it's, I almost cannot think of a time a photograph made me want to do one segment. You know, mm -hmm. one photograph made me say, God, I've got to do that. Uh -huh. um, but then again, I don't, I'm, I have very low visual credentials here. Right. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I am a guy on the radio. I right. need a thing to talk about. Um, but I do... Um, but I mean, in terms of an I, issue, I, in terms of what personally impacts you. Um, I, you know, I, I have this thing. I, I think being on the radio so much has made me like a, an attention deficit person when it comes to visual stuff. And I try to overcompensate at times. And, um, and I try to, uh, I've got some hyper learning to do about visual stuff. So I, it turns out all my hobbies are about uh, things like gardening. I like gardening. It's super visual. I like to put all the colors together and everything. I do a lot of prairie gardening. Um, I tie-dye stuff with my kids. I got really into tie-dying with my kids and I, I got pretty damn good at it. Okay, okay. So I got Wow. Um, so I got that for a hobby and then I, I actually do, I took a black and white photography course when I was in high school and kept doing it until two years ago I made myself stop shooting black and white film. But I do shoot black and white film. Yeah, I've, I've, I've developed in the dark room in my crawl space. Here's the picture of my kids uh -huh. and my wife at Mount Rushmore, trying to be Mount Rushmore. That I <laughs> have one, though, right? And um, <laughs> so that, and this is my wife's tie-dye shirt, which is does not look oh, yeah. good in black and white. <laughs> but um, so I and I, um, I mean, for I had an interesting encounter with my dog. He's. Um, a, he's kind of emotionally distant, and he's. Uh, I'm trying to understand him. I just got him a couple years ago, and I started reading this book about dogs and why they are the way they are. And it was talking about dogs' eyes, and um, 
they're different from ours, and I was trying to explain why the dog leaves something and can't see the thing you see in the middle of the floor when you throw it out there and the dog is staring. Why the dog come, you call the dog back and it comes to the guy next to you instead of coming to you, the, it, the person who it owns. We're, all of which is happening to my dog. And, um, and then it starts explaining about their rods and cones and how we have, they have a lot of uh, cones, I think, and they're good at seeing movement and seeing things in the dark. We have a lot of rods, so we see a lot of colors that they don't see. We, and our, our eyes are made to focus. We focus different than them. We, and, our, and the book, the psychologist who was writing this book on dogs, says we focus on people's, eye, uh, people's faces. Well, that's why we have a focus in our eye, is so that we can read the other people in draw these conclusions and, and everything really fast. And this is what I, this is the strength of photography, I think, is that we can, um, it creates, we're, we're doing that. We're doing that with the faces we see in the pictures. And that's why I like pictures of faces a lot, so that I can have empathy with that person. You know, I can, I can try to picture myself and the information I have about the situation. Is this person a Syrian? In, in this situation, I, ca I can kind of read myself into there. And there's a great picture in the uh, Times to New York Times today uh, of Central African Republic, a place, you know, I talk about places all over the world. I have no game on Central African Republic. I just have, don't have a good picture of what it's like or what it, what hap you know, what's really going on. But I'm going to talk about it on the radio. And um, But this picture, like, does it for me. Here's a little girl and her mom and her mom's steadfastly getting her out and she's terrified and they're shooting guns and um, that they're having a conflict right there. Um, so I want to, so I think the photograph, I'm looking at that girl's face and I can do it, you know? When you so interview wanna, someone on CAR, for example, yeah. um, let's assume Steve or somebody gave you some briefing papers or you did some research, or you, you're, you're ready to go for your interview. Do you look at the picture also? I mean, does that picture come to your mind? Yes. I mean, I almost I can't think of a thing without a picture, right? You know, Interesting for a Bosnia. guy who said he was not visual. I, uh, yeah, I know. It's, um, uh, they all, I think everybody, everybody can take any global event and think of a picture. Um, fall of the Berlin Wall. I can think of pictures about the U.S. invasion of Panama. I can, I can, you know, almost every one of them, I can think of some image that goes with it that, that spoke to the thing. Um, and you keep reporting on CAR. And I did. Well, yeah. And you're going to do well, it. It's, it's, it. There's a lot of people in trouble there. So it, I, I, there's I a lot I, of people in trouble. So I got to do that. It's interesting. But it's, you know, it's a combination with things, I think. Yeah. I mean, Ian, moving this to you, I guess I would ask, um, let's, let's talk about Bosnia or Syria, as you'd like. For example, somebody at the State Department, um, John has friends who are covering Syria, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many shows you've done on Syria and how many more you're going to do on Syria, but right. I'm pretty sure we're going to do one on Syria when we do this new exhibition, and there'll be lots of things, and you'll, you'll keep doing this. There's been a lot of photos, mm -hmm. the, horrific photos. Um, there's a tempsit movement. I mean, from, from, say, you're in the State Department, hypothetically, when these pictures come out, What's that like? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, we're, we're bombarded with, with images. So I think what you have to ask yourself, what, so what images actually have an impact? And I, as a State Department guy, I, I like to look at the pictures that will move the needle, as you mm -hmm. said, change uh, policymakers' calculations and make them change course. And when you uh, asked me to, uh, to participate tonight, one photo popped in my head right away because, um, you know, as you say, I, I served in the Balkans during the Civil War. I was in Belgrade between 90 and 92. And there was a place called Uncle Sam's in the embassy. Uh, the war started in 91 in Croatia and then April 92 moved to, um, uh, moved to Bosnia. And that's when it really got bad. Uh, but anyway, 
There was a journalist named Jonathan Landay. I don't know if you if you know that name. He, he writes for Knight Ritter, and he um, was shaking because he'd come back from Bosnia. So this is like May, I think, of '92, and he gave us this this uh, horrifying report of um, of Bosnians being rounded up and put into camps. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, we reported this back to Washington, uh, and um, the response we got back from Washington was, um, "Look, this is." It's horrible what's going on there. It's not just the Serbs, it's the Croats, it's the Bosnians, it's a tribal thing. This goes back centuries. We can't do anything except maybe provide food. We can't really have an effect here. And um, we were making the argument that, wait a second, no, it is, it is a whole different degree with Milosevic because Milosevic, he, he had a, um, a real policy that was really um, leading to horrible things going on. And the, the policy was to take over the Yugoslav National Army, so he had all the weapons. It was to demonize, dehumanize the Muslims uh, in, in Bosnia and make it a lot easier to, to commit atrocities. And then finally, he had this, this policy of all Serbs in one state. So he wanted to cleanse out the non-Serbs uh, from areas of Bosnia and create one state uh, you know, of, of Serbia and parts of Bosnia and parts of Croatia. Um, and this was, this, was the, this was the attitude of our, our European colleagues, too. They didn't want, didn't want to get involved either. They were happy to have an excuse mm -hmm. not to get involved. And there was one photo that just blew that whole image uh, up and that photo and this is the photo that popped in my head this is it was a cover this is the cover of time magazine i can just hear my young son saying really lame dad why are you showing a little uh, printout why didn't you uh, get a <laughs> get the slide so you could all see it but the reason why i exploded the myth was it brought back images of world war ii and you can see here, you can see young men with their ribs showing, emaciated, obviously abused. You can see lines of barbed wire going across here. This galvanized the international community. Now, it didn't stop the war. But what it did was it started, um, the, the, the UN developed um, a, a force that, um, that created what we call safe zones. Of course, they weren't terribly safe either. Look at uh, Srebrenica. Yeah. But it still galvanized the international community uh, into action. Um, so that, you know, that, that to me is, it, I mean, this, this is a real iconic photo to show how an image can change policy. Um, it's interesting because, as I, I don't know that Ron took that one, but, um, but not only can it change policy, but perhaps slowly. Unfortunately, and if yeah. it's your life or your child's life, right. slow is not okay. Right. But, um, but because these photographs have become evidence, because photographs from the Holocaust have become evidence, um, the question now, for example, we're about to start a project um, in Bosnia and Sarajevo, and everybody that we're talking to at the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina is saying that the situation is very, very tense that there's huge pressure to shut the courts down. And the courts are, are the courts that the ICC, you know, ICTY has referred back to, and they're supported only by donors. They're, they're not really supported by the, the country. Um, so the question will be is if tensions flare again, do these photographs stop the next wave? Because it says this is how bad it can get. Do journalists suddenly start saying, hey guys, remember this was not very long ago. Um, or do they go into the archive and then we do it again? You know, um, I think it's a combination of things that are, are, I mean, that have to come together for real action. Um, and awareness is only the first step, right? I mean, just knowing that there are these people in Syria and it is hell for right. people in Syria, uh, we don't know how to s exactly figure that thing out effectively. Right. 
I mean, it is interesting, though. I was thinking about Syria. So, so much of the photography from Syria is not from professional photographers for all kinds of safety reasons and, and, and people who can't go and so forth. But when the chemical weapons issue, issue, when chemical weapons were used in a widespread manner on young children, on civilians, and pretty quickly it became clear that even the Russians couldn't think that it was somebody else, the UN was able to mobilize and we went down this path of sort of, we're going to eradicate the chemical weapons. And I'm looking at you a little bit because it seems like maybe that was something people could get their hands around and, and their well, head I, around. I, I think the, the reason why this photo made a difference was because um, up till this photo, everybody could feel very comfortable and say, yeah, it's horrible. A lot of people are dying, you know, there, there's atrocities, but what do we do? I mean, right. where, where do we, you know, where do we apply pressure? This photo showed Milosevic was the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was up to, to, to really, really horrible things. And so it was after, you know, this is probably facile to say it was after this photo. Sure, but this, this contributed to this, uh, the people coming around to the idea that, okay, we have somebody who belongs in a, in a uh, you know, who's a war criminal right. and, and needs to be stopped. Right. Uh, whereas in the, in the case of Syria, um, yes, uh, I mean, I think Bashar al-Assad is, is a war criminal, but whose side do you come down on? I mean, that's, I mean, we could, we could come down on the side of the, there was a Bosnian government mm -hmm. that we could support. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not an expert on Syria, mm -hmm. and I, th I, I tend to lean towards more, doing more rather than less, but still, mm -hmm. who do we support? But 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 as the as what is what is the Free Syrian Army? What are the rebel forces? Who who are actual Syrians? Who should be in charge? And the sort of paralysis because we can't figure out exactly who to back, which is then exacerbated when you have videos of Al Qaeda associated freedom fighters, rebels, terrorists, depending on your vocabulary, assassinating people. Right. You know, I, I wouldn't mind saying to... something about the ubiquitousness of the image we get from Syria, because there are tons of bad images from Syria that don't move the needle. I mean, lots of them. Horrific. I mean, you can go, it's unbelievable to go on YouTube and you, you can watch videos yeah. all day long yeah. of uh, jets bombing, uh, jets bombing, uh, you know, Aleppo. Uh, yeah. You can just like, here's a town and there, here's some jets that are bombing it and they, there's guys on their porches with their phones and you, and it's really unbelievable, but yeah. nobody watches these things. I mean, I'm sitting there with 166 people on YouTube or something, and uh, people don't honestly, uh, I mean, it's, uh, we avert our gaze. We've seen, uh, I don't know, have we seen this before? I don't know, but there's so many of these things, and we don't, um, there's, there's a way, uh, there's an aversion at, at some point, I think. But these, these children wrapped in bags, sort of. Yeah. It's, yeah, the other it's, part of this is it was Europe too, and we had this whole myth of never again, and this was in Europe. Right. Uh, and I think you're right, Jerome, that this is, this is coming on the heels of Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. and yeah, I think there is a bit of fatigue there. In terms of that. Changing it a little bit, I was thinking, we talked about um, Abu Ghraib, so a very different kind of use of photography. I mean, not not about something happening in quote unquote another country where those who don't believe you know that uh that we have a responsibility to act all the time you know you can't say much when your own military is behaving in a way that certainly breaks american military law um you know the use of photography when you see something that's within our power you know, I'm thinking of... Well, I think, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the, the work that... It, it, this is... It's kind of more cut and dried a little bit in certain uh, international situations. I think it's something when it's... Like you're talking about when it's a military, you have to look at yourself and start to see your own policies and how they play out. And what is it like in a policy in your hometown? What is the policy on a border? What is the policy of the US military in Iraq, in Afghanistan, what is the real impact of that? And I think that's, you know, there's an assumption in saying that, well, the US intervention is gonna be the right thing. 
mm-hmm. or it can be. And mm-hmm. I think in um, Bosnia it did help. Um, sometimes it may not be the right thing, and it can cause great harm. So um, it's. I think it, at the end of the day, photography can be manipulated, and I think that's really the hard thing about it. Like you talked about with Ansel Adams, that was very calculated to have an, uh, an effect. And, you know, how they're used, who takes them, why they're presented in what context is really a big thing. I had a guy on from Ukraine this week, yeah. and he had, he had been out of the country for a little bit and gone back in to Kiev, and, um, and he was reading the news reports that everybody reads outside the country and looking at all the pictures of tires burning and uh, militancy inside Ukraine. And then he went out there and talked to everybody, and he said, it's not like that at all. It's not, it's not like that. You're in the wrong pictures. You know, they're, you know, everybody's just taking, running the pictures of the guys with the fire, the burning right, tires. Right, the three guys with the burning tires. The, the skinheads yeah. with the burning tires. But there's uh, yeah. 10,000 people that are sitting there who are perfectly peaceful and everything's fine. Right. It's not, you know, you're seeing right. the wrong thing. Right. And well, it's a question of who's, what, what picture you're taking, what, what photo editor will publish, what, what the publisher thinks will sell, you know, We'll sell the the media, whatever it is. And there's, I mean, the the story had did turn, you know, right. like last weekend. It got different. There were people dying. There was confrontations. That's, there were yeah. things burning in the street. So it did. It wasn't, you know, uh, uh, you know, unreal. That was right. real. But right. it was amplified in a way that uh, you know, an observer there would think was completely giving people <laughs> the wrong impression. Right. I mean, I think it. I think this. Looking inside thing is interesting. I was thinking about Abu Ghraib today and the chain sort of between there and Guantanamo. Mm-hmm. So we have a president now who's fully into his second term. He ran on the idea that he was going to close Guantanamo day one, I think. So it's not closed yet. No. Last I checked, this is in a country. It really was day one too. It's first it was that was the first thing he was going to be signing. Yeah. It was you know yeah. day one. Um, he got elected, so there's clearly some support for this. I mean. Maybe that's not why people voted for him, but, uh, you know. Um, and and the American military took a huge hit at Abu Ghraib mm-hmm. around the world and internally. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, again, this, this was another fo- image or set of images that exploded a, um, a myth. Mm-hmm. And the, the myth was the Bush administration's uh, uh, image of the U.S. Army going in to liberate a country to free the country from, from a dictator. And yes, he was a horrible, horrible dictator. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were spreading democracy and freedom. Uh, this totally blew that up again. Uh, so it became another one of these, you know, turning points in the way people thought about right. the, the situation in Iraq. We weren't just liberators there. We were doing some horrible things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, it, uh, you know, I don't know if it got the Bush administration to change their policy, but it certainly right. changed the way Americans thought about, about the the, the, um, the Iraq War. Um, I was... but, but it really, I mean, there were people talk, coming out of Iraq and saying, you know, I think we're torturing people. I think we're torturing people. Mm-hmm. But it never, it didn't have any legs until right. the pictures. Yeah, um, that's right. And then. Um, well, the segment you did on the other day on violence, uh, or terrible violence from, from drone strikes. Yeah. I was thinking, I was driving, listening to you, which often happens, um, and I was thinking, you know, by their very nature, drone strikes happen in surprise. There's, there's, now that we have social media, we might have a photograph of the immediate aftermath or of it happening, but it isn't the same thing as a traditional battle. I mean, Kappa could go and be on the boat in D-Day because they told him there was gonna be a boat and you can get on it and you can do this if you want to. Um, But there's been horrific violence that have come out of it. The question of whether it's, I mean, not to go down the path of whether it's legal or not legal or this or that because that's an important conversation not to have quickly, but we don't see it. We don't have a picture of it, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a wedding party blown up. 70 children died. I don't see that. Doesn't yeah. Have impact, right. 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 And, right. Right. We have pictures of Syria. We are very clear that this has happened. And Russia sort of lost the battle pretty fast. I mean, it was a couple of news cycles, and then they lost the battle as to, to who had gassed these children. Well, I think the drone strikes are interesting because 
A, they, they work in collaboration with local uh, people, so they kind of sows distrust within the communities over there, so it adds that. But then it also, it's kind of fascinating because it's a way that the war is changing, right? So you kind of pulling troops back, and now it's becoming this more uh, hidden war, essentially, which is less visual, which then gets back to, if it you can't see it, and then the people can't react to it as strongly, and therefore you can kind of carry on a war, or you can carry on the, the policy without worrying as much about the blowback mm -hmm. of constant images of torture. Mm -hmm. You don't have to put people directly into contact in that way. Um, so I think it's just kind of interesting how technology and photography as information is used. I mean, I think the NSA leaks, you know, Abu Ghraib, all these things are, you know, fly in the face of, you know, what's, you know, in what we think of as the myth of the United States and the nation, right? So you, th you want to say, well, it's all in good stead, but you're tapping, you know, uh, Angela Merkel's phone, your your ally's phone, it's like, okay, there's some real problems there. Slightly awkward. Right, and then how do you deal with information and how do you deal with policy, but also deal with the real issues of terrorism and of um, national security and of, you know, U.S. interests and economic policy and all these things. And it kind of goes back to similar things with migration, ultimately, in a lot of ways, too. You know, you have millions of people who can, for a long time, came here to get jobs but you kind of don't really want to recognize because that would cause another thing. So it's just, it's all kind of interwoven. I mean, it's really fascinating. September 10th, 2001, there was supposed to be a, a, an accord, a border accord between Vicente Fox and Bush. And they were gonna open the border. September 11th happened. And like since then, it was a complete and total change in border policy, which affected millions of people who really weren't necessarily caught up in any sense uh, of the word in, in, in terms of global terrorism. And so, but it impacted public policy, it created wars, and then the U.S.-Mexico buildup. And it's kind of amazing. So, it's it's funny just know. that it happened at a time when we actually had George Bush and John McCain kind of at the height of their power in many ways, that their influence, yeah. who both wanted reform and and put some political skin in the game to get reform and yeah. couldn't get it through their own party, right. much less the rest of the country. Um, we have a few more minutes, and I wondered if there were some questions from folks. Um, uh, you were talking about bearing witness, being witness. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds like your questions are sort of touching on whether photographers are doing advocacy work goals with their pictures, in the sense that they're creating change with their pictures. but. I think if I were to ask you, that's not why you're taking the pictures, or maybe, or is that your, how does that play a role in how you Yeah, do your I mean, work? to me, I take pictures for a lot of different reasons. I take pictures because I, I love the action, I love the process. I take pictures because I believe strongly in showing what's going on in the world. I believe they can help change. I believe that we have to do our, my little part. That's my little contribution to this world, basically, is to, I'm good at it. I know how to, I like taking pictures and I can kind of bear witness and then they can get used and sometimes they can help a little bit. Um, it was kind of funny, the other day I was in a vacant lot on like 67th Street and I was talking to Carlos about this and I'm taking a picture of this really amazing mural, these like five black women just afros and like super proud, each one with a kind of different expression on the wall. And it was just really, really great and it was like nice light I'm taking a picture, I'm taking like for about 10 minutes to shoot this picture. And a guy walks by and he goes, you know, a guy from the neighborhood, he goes, you know, I've never noticed that picture before you took, I've never noticed that wall before you took the picture. You know, and it was like, that was kind of powerful to me because it was like, man, that it, that it just like one, even that one-on-one -on -one interaction to me is important. That in that moment, this guy is seeing something that he's walking by like every day, this amazing mural. And of course, we all walk by stuff every day that we never even notice, right? But this is like, you know, the women who hold up the community, you know, emblemized on the wall. And like, he's sort of just walking by it, not seeing it. So then I'm sitting there, I'm like, yeah, that's important because I'm doing it. And I put it on Instagram and then I put it on Facebook or whatever. 
and then you know someone else might see it you know and then i say like the different platforms that we can use are kind of amazing right now because like i put some pictures on facebook the other day and an editor picked it up said hey why don't you do a story and i was able to tell a story about both the cold in chicago but also like the supermarkets closing and what that means for the community i live in and so in that same instance you know you know you could say well this doesn't mean anything but you're in that that's what i can do i, I can get a story that nobody really cares about <laughs> that the neighborhood doesn't really have a supermarket except us because now we don't have a supermarket to go to um and there, i mean and obviously other communities are dealing with this with this dominic's closing but what seems kind of small and inconsequential is just something that you can get out so i say take take action and to answer your question yes i believe strongly that our photographs can have good impacts on a personal level, on a, you know, like community level, you know, and on a national level and on an international level, you know, but it's not always that every picture you're going to take is going to have impact. It's just that you have to do your best to put them out and then work with people like Leslie and, you know, Carlos does a lot of work. He did a lot of great work doing work about violence and similar issues and all these different things going on. And we put it out. And then hopefully, you know, it can get into one kid's brain not to pick up a gum one day. Or someone else says, hey, man, what are you doing? You know, instead of like, you know, they might sit in the, seen that picture and go, man, you know, that, that, was my, that was my homie. You know, I don't want him to die. Like, put that gun down, you know. And that's teaching. That's what we have to do. We have to teach, you know, each other. And that's what we do. And so that's what photography can be about, you is know, teaching each other. I think the advocacy, uh, I mean... I think every photograph's an advocacy of something. I think every radio story is advocates something. Every everything you see and read in the media is advocating something. It might be advocating a status quo. It might be advocating, you know, something. But you know, just the decision to take a picture of those ladies was uh, an act of advocacy of something. Uh, you know, the decision to put um, my wife and I at the beginning of the Reagan administration started uh, that we noticed a campaign to make Ronald Reagan look silly uh, it, it was not well like even in the Chicago Tribune I don't think because they kept running funny pictures of him eating cake and you know the next day he's blinking and the next day you see you know it was like there's a there's an act of advocacy there you're you're I mean everything I think is advocating something yeah I think uh, one of the most uh, powerful illustrations of the um, how governments appreciate how powerful photographs are is the decision of the, of the George W. Bush administration, I think it was his decision, not to allow photographers to show the bodies of, oh, yeah. uh, of yeah. huge soldiers coming huge. back. Yeah. And then on the other side, the, the importance of the right kind of images is the decision to only use Pete Souza Right. The president's photographer. <laughs> well, he's taking yeah. a huge. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. taking yeah. a huge. Yeah. You know, and, and after and hosting his wedding. <laughs> yeah. and, and an appreciation of how yeah. important, right. what kind of photographs are shown. And, and that's so. all. I was just going to say, I think what we have to do as people of power in the room is to also to make sure that, that you want to let people know that you want to see those pictures. You know, um, a lot of editors get these, I don't know, things in their minds that would say, well, people don't want to see those pictures. You know, so we have to advocate as the public, hey, we want to, we want to know what happened to our friend. Right. Good friend of our pot eyes for the story on, and he was one of the only photographers at that time who had access to what happens when a soldier is buried. And the reason why he had access to it is because him and the writer spent a lot of time getting this access. And then they open up the floodgates when, when these pictures came mm -hmm. of soldiers coming home on commercial airplanes, some of them, and there's these people looking up. But, you know, sometimes we forget that we need to see those pictures. So I, I, we advocate to you guys that Please help us, you know, talk, send emails right, out to right. editors, let Support. people know that you want to see that, you want to listen to these stories, because you're public and they're, you know, right? I mean, yeah. 
Definitely. I mean, it's supply yeah, and demand. It, people, <laughs> people need to voice their opinions that photography is, you know, photography about social justice and documentary photography is important and that it's something you would want to, you know, support. But also, you know, I think the decision, you know, we all make a decision to do something in it. Some people, it's not photography. Some people, it's writing. Some people, it's like, hey, you know, like Carlos is saying, call your editor or call them. Call WZ. We want to see more pictures. You know, we love pictures. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know there you go. You know, but it could be anything, right? You know, so do something. I think if you make that, you know, kind of uh, uh, choice to make the world a little better in your sphere, and try to do something that can try to make a little bit witness and do whatever. That's really good. Are there but, any other questions? Other topics? You know, I have one more quick little thing to say. It's like the, you talk about the advocacy. Um, when we go and take pictures in these situations, that's a very personal decision each time. When you put yourself into danger sometimes and you put yourself into these highly charged at times emotional situations or it's really easy sometimes to go, oh, no, I don't want to go to that, you know, or ignore it. You know, like I remember this one night I was driving back and... Um, and there was these flashing lights near my house, and I'm like, you know, it was like 9.45 at night, and I'm like, oh man, do I wanna go and check it out, or do I not wanna go and check it out, do I wanna go and check it out, don't I? You know, and so then you decide, yes, I'm gonna go, and I call Carlos, I'm like, you gotta get down here, you know? And it's just like, this is what's going on, you know? And so it is definitely like a personal advocacy is like a thing that every day you have to make that personal choice. Yeah. And it was right. It was yeah. it was three kids who were killed, and this little girl is sitting there at the crime scene, just screaming, trying to get to her little brother, and she's screaming at the police, and they're having this like existential conversation in front of me about the impact. Like, she's like, "I hate you guys. You killed." Cause the police had shot her other brother, and so she's six years old, and she's screaming at him, "I hate you guys!" And they're like, "Why do you hate us?" You know, it's not us who killed your brother. She's like, you killed my other brother. And you know, so it's like they're having this argument and she runs and they grab her, you know? And so like, that's a situation that you, like, you never know what you're gonna come upon. You know what I mean? So you, but you, it's a personal decision to go and videotape and, or, or photograph it and witness that. And that's something that is, I think everybody should make. Not everybody has to make a decision about that, but to do something. It's good. That's what this is about. Leslie chooses to show pictures in this way and advocate in that way. I think we all have a responsibility tell story. To, to tell a story, do something for the world. Yeah, and I was curious. I think you had two photos there. Yeah. What was yeah. the other one? Well, I didn't want to. I, I actually, what, what I, I have this one for the, that's from the, the UN got involved. Right. And then there was the mortaring of the market in Sarajevo. And two weeks after that, NATO started to get involved and mm -hmm. shot down some airplanes and mm -hmm. shelled uh, uh, surf positions around Garajda. So that, that marketplace, that was more of a video than a, than a still. Mm -hmm. This sure. was a really yeah. powerful still. But. Sure. And, and I think that, that you know, there's, there's such a blurred line now. I mean, now that my phone can take a video and a still and make a collage out of it and send it to a photo editor in about 30 seconds, all that has been a bit collapsed. Um, Anybody, any other questions for the time for? But hold on, I'm gonna call you on that 30 second thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was 30 seconds. All right, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I wish it was. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Um, just in closing, um, you know, is there, what's the one photo you think you've ever taken that you, you either felt it made the biggest impact or, or, or thought it should have? Something come to mind? It's really bodies, of, for me, it's more about Body. bodies of work. You know, it's really about the ongoing, I'm less of like that one photograph that one? and more like bodies of work. I think the immigration project, Southside project, overtime. Is, Those are the ones that stuff. you yeah, do it lots I, of time. I try, yeah, over time. Jerome, when you, when you close your eyes and you like photograph the movie, is there one or just the whole, the series you, you know of Syria? I mean, the, the, the things I think that move the needle are or when we see the unseen, you know, when we're that Time Magazine cover and there's the starving guys, um, when we see into the prisons of Abu Ghraib, we saw the unseen. Um, the 
I think things like the tar sands, and even even if it doesn't have to be people, it can be places that we know we, we have no idea what the tar sands is, right? Yeah. But if you look at John's picture, you go, holy crap, the tar sands are something. I was on uh, Human Rights Watch's uh, website the other day and was w w watching a uh, video. They do those videos with a lot of stills in them. They're mostly stills with little chunks of video, and. Um, the gold mining, I was looking at the largest gold mine yeah. in Papua New Guinea, which I had never seen before. I know gold mining is bad. But then you see it and you go, oh my God, you know, we should not have gold things. These, it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so I, I think it's the unseen that really moves. The, well, that access, yeah. that, that idea that of the access. Just, yeah. yeah. And is it Bosnia for you? I mean, well, you know, actually, um, when I downloaded this photo and printed it out, I, I just read this review of um, a biography of, uh, and I forget his first name, Ambassador Dodd. This is the U.S. ambassador in Berlin. And, you know, I was reading about what he was doing, reporting about what Hitler was up to in the 30s. And I remember thinking, this is what we were doing in Belgrade, about what Milosevic is up to. Um, so, I mean, what would have happened if, if somebody had gotten into Bergen-Belsen, you know, which which was started up in the 30s, right. and been able to you know, get a picture like this out, right. would people have stood up to Hitler? I don't know. Um, but And 100,000 people still died in Bosnia, but maybe it would have been far more if it weren't for the you know, power of the media. And then I think about the brave people who go out and, and take these photos, too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, there were, there were a lot of journalists who were killed because they were trying to get the right photo. The rest of us fly out, out and these people are trying to get in. Yeah. I mean, you, you spend time around these people and they're like on two phones trying to figure out how you get in somewhere. Right. Anybody got a ride into Central right. African Republic? Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, we should, we should be respectful of your time and everybody's time. So um, please um, stay, chat, chat with our panelists, have some wine. Come back in March. Um, we are going to launch our first print exhibition on children in Syria. We will be programming with the Council on Global Affairs, with Loyola, with Northwestern. Um, we're very excited about that. Uh, Mandy Turk, who's advising us on that, is here. Um, uh, John, thank you so much. Thank you. Jerome, thank you, thank you so much. Ambassador, thank you, you so much. Yeah. And thank you guys all for coming. We really appreciate it.